You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back with another episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. (laughs) Woo! It has been a summer, and I am so happy to be back on here. I look forward to doing this podcast every week, as you all know. And this has just been an exciting week. So much is going on, and I just love talking to you all. And it's just been uh, so much life and experiences and surprises and all that jazz. So uh, where do I start? I mean, let me just say that I just have been getting myself ready for the fall. Right, less than two months away from the wedding, which I'm super excited about. You know, I'm going to be somebody's husband. And it's interesting because, like, it's all hitting me now. It's, like, hitting, hitting. At the wedding shower, it, it hit. But now it's, like, this is happening. Like, I'm going to be, like, like married, married, you know? Um, that's happening, of course, and, and all the updates with that. And I'm... Now I'm going to be a professor. I'm an adjunct professor at Cheney University, which is the nation's first HBCU. Okay? Cheney came out in the 1800s. Um, was founded in the 1800s. Uh, Bear Rustin, you know, my, you know, hero, um, went there. A couple of other great media people, black journalists like Ed Bradley, the legendary, you know, Robert Bogle, who is the owner and and, and publisher of the Philadelphia Tribune. A lot of great, um, incredible black people went to um, this historically black college and university. Um, People always say Lincoln University is the first um, HBCU, but it's actually not. Cheney is. Um, The the distinction, the debate is that Cheney was the first institution, like this period. It's the first HBCU that 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 was on the ground, period. Lincoln was the first that gave out um, degrees. It was the first, um, you know, degree accredited giving institution. Um, so that's why people always try to act like Cheney. I mean, that Lincoln is the first, but Lincoln isn't. Cheney is, but Lincoln was the first to give out degrees, but uh, that are like you know college degrees or whatnot. But Cheney was the first institution. First, it, it provided people to train the skills of the education and as a functionality. Um, that was served for black people to go there. That's what it is. And so it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. So yes, I am an adjunct professor um, focused on teaching uh, journalism courses and things of that nature. Uh, I'll be doing some you know, guest lectures and other stuff with the, with the institution. And you know, this process has been exciting. You know, I spent the whole summer you know, on the low, um, basically doing a lot of... Uh, you know, paperwork and listen, it's the, this is probably the first um, like job where I've had to like give out a CV and do all of the interviews and all of that because for many years, you know, my name alone carries, you know, carries some weight. You know, people just like, look, you can Google Ernest and, and know what he's about, but in academia spaces, you know, you have to have all of your, your ducks in a row. You have to have the extensive CV. You have to have you know, the reference letters and all that kind of stuff. So I definitely um, had to, to, you know, get my get my ducks in order to do what I need to do. But went through the process, the the, um, the department chair, you know, really uh, embraced me, you know, the provost, the, the people at the institution really, um, you know, like what I'm about and uh, thought I was a great asset. And I purposely chose to uh, teach at HBCU because, you know, too often, you know, I have always felt that, Black journalists and, 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 and people like myself who's influential are often going to the predominantly white institutions. We're, we're often going to the University of Pennsylvania and the USC's and places like that. And, you know, these are schools I went to. And, I, and, I, and you know, I'm a proud you know, Quaker and I'm a proud Trojan and all that. But I, I just felt like I want to be somewhere where I can, you know, make a different type of mark and, and influence. And... Um, you know, an HBCU like Cheney, and that's not too far from Philadelphia, allows me to be of influence to a group of students who don't oftentimes get 
people like me um, in their classrooms, you know, um, as much because oftentimes a lot of great journalists that are in this profession, you know, they're they're running to the bigger schools. And, you know, there's reasons for that, right? More pay, more prestige, all that kind of stuff. But there's something about starting in this adjunct professor world um, at an HBCU like this. And um, it just felt good to be able to put on that that royal blue hoodie and um, sweater and, you know, have the chain letters and go to the campus and, and see faculty and see people there. That just felt good. So this fall, I look forward to instilling wisdom and knowledge with these students and being able to engage with the campus on some other great projects and opportunities. And, you know, you go where you celebrate it. You know, I, I think about, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who just had the, the stuff that she was dealing with, um, with the predominantly white college. And now she's going to Howard and she's going to be there and she's going to, you know, um, you know, she's working with Tani She Coates and they're going to be teaching and instilling and inspiring young minds in journalism. And, you know, Howard's like the one of the Harvards of the HBCU. So they, they got all the resources, you know, Felicia Rashad is there, all of the, the folks. But Cheney is an institution that I think some people have slept on in recent years. And to be there and to build this enthusiasm for the school and be a part of that change, um, it was just a boss ass move. And some of you all were surprised and shocked by it. And and I love that. That's good. Like, like I'm happy people are having conversations about HBCUs. Um, and that's been part of the wave in, in the recent two years. I mean, you know, Vice President Kamala Harris went to Howard. And so there's been more conversations about uh, supporting historically black colleges and universities. And I'm kind of happy to be a part of that larger discussion, um, even as someone who went to an Ivy League school, because, you know, we, we, we are seeing that all of these colleges and institutions need support. And for black talent and influencers and leaders, you know, go, let's meet people where they are. Let's, let's meet people there, you know? Um, so that was a lot of what drove my interest in being there. And also I've been teaching in different capacities for years. You know, as you all know, I've done stuff with Upper Bound. I've done workshops and trainings and all types of different guest lectures and appearances. And so I thought this would be a good opportunity, you know, right after I just got this great master's to say, hey, let me put let me put a ring on it, you know, in the sense of let me put a real title. So to be able to, you know, have people call me Professor Owens is I'm I'm I got I was saying on Instagram and Twitter that I was like, it's so weird that people like are referring to me that way. Like I know, I get it, I earned it, I worked hard, yada yada yada, yes, but it just feels so good that you know, like people are like oh yeah professor owens needs yada 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 i'm like professor owens who are they talking about and then i'm looking at myself like that's me so it, it, it's been a flattering experience i'm super excited i'm very happy for the people who recommended me um the department the humanities department for uh unanimously voting for my uh placement and appointment and yeah so i'm excited I would be remiss if I did not mention that while I've been on this preparation to be a professor at a college, this past weekend, I moved my um, younger brother to Temple University, as you all know. Um, and what an experience that was. So now I can say something about Temple. And... For my Temple Owls listening to this, you know, there is no shade because it's really no shade, actually. But some people saw the Instagram story when we was moving my little brother in and all of that and, and the experiences. And, and there's just something I have to say about this. Because now I can because now we're, you know, we're in, you know, he starts school next week, you know, school starts next week. So I, I can say a couple of things now because things, have, you know, dust has settled. So I don't, you know, look. When I went to Penn, which was 11 years ago when I was a freshman, woo, time flies. Um, over a decade ago, um, if a, it, you know, as a freshman, housing was guaranteed. If you was a little late on registering or getting your housing or whatever the case is, there was going to be a bed for your ass. Okay, that, that's just 
my experience. I didn't know that such an experience was uh, an Ivy League experience or a, a experience of a very private elite school that that was a, a privilege, a luxury to have the, the no. Uh, that wasn't the case for my brother. So what happened is, is that we paid the deposit uh, for the housing and for tuition and all that stuff. That stuff got taken care of. It was all good. We was happy. We was excited. We thought that was perfect. Shouldn't be any problems. That's what we thought. Okay. Well, somewhere mid in the midsummer, they told us that, um, you know, hey, uh, housing has been filled up. There is no more housing available for freshmen. I was confused. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We paid a deposit. What, what are you talking about? Well, they were supposed to select their housing and get their room and according... But we didn't get any emails. Well, did you call? But no one called us. It was complicated. It was crazy. So in conversation, you know, finding this shit out, basically, my little brother did not have housing for the fall. So there's a happy ending. Let me just say that before you all are feeling this frustration. I'm like, how do freshmen at a school, especially someone who is out of town, who pays a deposit, don't have housing midsummer, that you're saying that there's nowhere for them to live? And you're saying that freshmen are expected to live on campus the first year. How is this possible? This doesn't make sense to me. I am losing it. So initially, when we had this conversation, when I spoke to the housing people and the things at Temple, I said, okay, um, so what does this mean? They're like, well, you know, they could just defer for a year and then come back. No, 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 we don't, no, 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 no. That, no, that's not happening. Okay, next option. Well, they can live off campus um, and there's some places they can live. I said, okay, cool. Um, where, where, what's, the, what's the tea, what's good? So they give me these really over the top, like super, super far out, high rise. Play. I was like, this is impossible. This doesn't make sense. So then, you know, talking to my, you know, fiance and talking to Mr. Johnson, of course, I said, hey, you know, when we was in school and it was off campus, because I always stayed on campus while, when I was at Penn, like all four years. But um, the final, I think, year when my fiance was staying, he was working on, on a political campaign, took a semester off, and lived with me. They could have financial aid could provide for housing. So you could live off campus and there's financial aid for your housing off campus. And there was a situation we could do that. I was like, okay, you know what? I said to them, is there any like student housing that's off campus that accepts financial aid? And then the woman on the phone was like, oh, there are a couple of options. I said, see, this is the bullshit I'm talking about. This should have been told to me up front. I shouldn't have had to deal with all this. So anyway, get a nice place. The place that he's staying at is gorgeous. Lovely. You all saw. Some of y'all saw in the video. Listen, um, the, 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 the stove is a real full stove. It's one of those electronic stoves without the coils. Like, you put it on a pot, it boils water in 30 seconds. Stainless steel, marble countertops. The bathroom is gorgeous. He has his own room. He's got high tables. He's got a flat screen TV framed up. I was like, shit, check you out. Lives right next to campus, but quote unquote, living off campus housing. And the gag is the month, the, um, the financial aid covers it. He, they accept his financial aid. And the crazy part is, is that that place is less than, is way cheaper than the on-campus housing if he would have did that. Just wanted to take a moment to sip my drink and reflect on the fact that we got a deal. So that was a game changer. Actually a blessing in disguise because when he got the lease for the new place, he got the move into campus earlier. So we moved him in and got him situated over the weekend. Um, 
places. The, the pad is nice. It was fabulous. My fiance and I have a new car now. You know, I don't know how to drive, so it's not like I'm driving the whip. But he has a new car, and he's you know, cute in his car. And it was great because my mom came into town. My other little brother came. So we was just driving through Philly, shopping and getting things. It was, it was a great weekend. It was a great setup. Um, but, like, I'm thinking to myself, he lucked out because technically he gets to have an off-campus living experience situation um, without having all of the, the crazy expenses that would have came if he lived on campus. Um, in a way, he's building his credit because he gets to, you know, kind of have something in his name as property. And he's able to really, you know, have some independence and space, not sharing a room. And I mean, during this pandemic, sharing rooms during COVID, woo, that, that's tough. So it worked out. But it's just shocking that these are the things that's coming up. So I'm realizing I'm going to have to be that big brother um, for him and, and, and kind of, you know, like I look for, I, I kind of enjoy it. I kind of like that I have a, a sibling in Philly. It's, it's going to be fun. I think to a certain extent, you know, we, you know, he is getting a little used to this lifestyle. So the first day he came here, and I don't know who did it, but he was walking down the street by himself, actually. And somebody stopped him because they recognized him and was like, you're Ernest's brother. Oh, my goodness. He's such a good journalist. Yada, 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 yada. He was telling him all this stuff. And he was just, you know, smitten by it. He was just grinning and, and, and sweet about it, apparently. And he tells me this story. I'm just like, oh, God, it's already happy. It's already been stopped. So he's just like, it's, it's, I'm just like, I, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. He told me, I was like, oh, gosh, it's already happening. It was like his first day here. And, um, you know, we went to a media event together. Um, you know, I get to go to media events. And so this was cute. It was appropriate. It was the Van Lurian's ice cream place that's, um, in the neighborhood that just opened that was with the old Capagero, we went there for ice creams, a media pri- a private media party, and we had ice cream and everything. And, and he was just, you know, everybody kind of like knew him and knew he was going to Temple, and he was all like, you know, into the moment. And I was like, okay. But in my head, I was just talking to my friends. I was like, I have to make sure that this is not a thing, you know, like, like it's like, uh, you know, Paris and Nikki Hilton, like, you know, the, the siblings is going to all the part. Like, I have to make sure that he knows and he does that. He's a student first. So we'll be going to one to two events together a month. And mind you, we might do dinner and things, but I want him to really have a college experience and have a normal life, whatever that means, um, until he turns 21. Because most of the events I go to, they're like 21. There's drinks, there's stuff. But then some of them, like the ice cream event, which is cute. It was ice cream. It was, you know, it was PG. But I told him, I was like, listen... Don't get any ideas that this is going to be the thing. Like, you know, you, you, you're going to go and you're going to go to school and you're going to be smart and you're going to read books and you're going to study and that's going to be what's going to be. And he seems to be down with that. He, he, you know, but at the same time, I think he kind of likes the perks and stuff. So, like, for example, we're going to like a, 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 like a small mini like music festival thing, but it's not like epic like Made in America, even though he has tickets to Made in America. I'm still debating if I want him to go to that personally, but he is excited about this other event we're going to call S'more Fest. We have like some VIP tickets and he's like excited to go to that, but he's doing good. He's at Temple. He's already made some friends. Um, he's already made some friends and everything. He's kind of, you know, a social butterfly. He's meeting people. He's learning his way around. Um, I took him to the best cheesesteak place in Philadelphia because he wanted a cheesesteak. And I took him to Delisandro's because that is the best Philadelphia cheesesteak. And I want to be, I want to say that on the record because people have asked me that for years. The best cheesesteak in, in Philadelphia is Delisandro's. It's the best because number one, that, that steak, that ribeye, that good quality ribeye is chopped. You have to chop it. That slicing shit that some of these places do, uh-uh. It's chopped. You have to chop it because you have to let the meat and the seasoning open up and loosen up for the aroma. Okay? Now, Wiz is for Taurus, and I have to teach him that. It's provolone. Sharp provolone. You have to have it with sharp provolone. American Wiz, that's for the kids. This is grown folks eating, okay? You need to have sharp provolone 
with the chopped. And you got to have it with the fried onions. Raw onions? What are you, a savage? You don't have raw onions. You have fried onions. Okay? Fried. And you got to have the peppers. And you got to have cherry pepper. If you don't have the cherry pepper with the cheese, with the cheese that, you, you miss that um, that fl that flavor. Okay? That's the basics. You just have to have it like that. That's how I eat my cheesesteak. Now, sometimes, you know, I, I, no, sidebar, I don't know, people judge, and I know, I get it. Sometimes I like to have a cheesesteak hoagie with no lettuce stuff, because lettuce is just ridiculous. I like a little cheesesteak hoagie every now and then. Not with the other condiments, but like, you know, tomatoes and, you know, I kind of like it sometimes. But my standard cheesesteak, if I am at De Los Angeles and I have to hurry the hell up, we are doing provolone, sharp provolone. There's a difference between sharp provolone and regular provolone. You have to have sharp provolone, okay? You got to have that roll with the fried onions, with the peppers, okay? And, you know, the hoagie. Best damn cheesesteak in Philadelphia is at De Los Andros, period. Don't, listen, listen. Now, I know there are the side johns, which he said john to me. I said john. You mean john, side johns, but it, it takes time. It took me time to develop my understanding of how to say these other Philly terms. It's taking time. He's a Texan. And he's actually a Texan. So he was born in Sugarland, but, you know, of course, grew up in Houston, but he was born in Sugarland, uh, which is basically like a, how would I describe, like the main line of, of Houston, I would suppose. Sugarland would be like to you all who saw my Philadelphia. But he's a Texan. He says to me, everyone has an accent. He doesn't think he has an accent. I'm like, you have an accent, kid. You just think everyone else do. And Philadelphia has such a strong accent, a very strong accent. And, and it's grown on me a little bit, you know, clearly. But for him, it's, it's, it's something serious. And then, of course, my man has a Jersey accent. He's from Trenton, and he wants you to know that. So it's been interesting. We, we did dinner, the family, at the Hoagie Room. So they had really good hoagies. And the best damn pizza in Philadelphia, which is at Pizzeria Badia. So we did the hoagie room and the private hoagie room, and it was fabulous as always. And you know, I've been, this is like the second time this year I've been. And every time I go, it's magical. It never gets old. And I never eat everything. And it's phenomenal. And it was phenomenal. It was perfection. It was so good. And then, of course, I went to Atlantic City for a staycation. I went to the ocean. Okay, with Mr. Johnson. It was fabulous. It was it was a great time. It was romantic. We went to Amada uh, for dinner. We did brunch at this place called Harper's. Ocean was great. We had the cabanas. And I told you I don't need cameras for the beach. But the cabana was a private cabana with a, with a view to look at the beach. So I'd have to get in the beach because the sand and all that. I just, I'm not crazy about it. Now, I've been to some beaches in my lifetime. Like, I've been to Tel Aviv. So when I was in Israel, I, I, I had, and I also went to the Dead Sea and got all in the mud. And I thought that was beautiful. And I was floating. It was great. Been to Peru a couple years ago. Did some work there. Had a great time in Peru. The Peru, Peruvian beach was fun. So I, had, and I mean, I grew up in Houston. So Galveston Beach, right? So I've had some beach experiences. I'm just not crazy about them um, anymore. I don't know. Sand and all that. I just feel like it's just too much. It's too much. I just... I can't get down with beaches. I'm just never crazy about it. I think maybe because I see so many pictures of beaches that I've been completely, like, over it. Like, I've been so over beach pictures. I, I, I feel like every time I go on social media, everybody's in a bathing suit getting, you know, ready for a beach. So I just, I, I never have been hype about it that way. Um and it's not because I don't think I'm a beach body. I don't think it's about body. It's just it's like, okay, how many times are you going to see people in the same setup? It's sand. It's water. The water is pretty. There might be... A, I don't even think people even take pictures. I don't even think there's any beach coconut trees anywhere anymore. So it's like sand, water, a view. Okay. And you could really only be any fucking where at this point. Like, people travel to go to beaches. Like, really? That's what you're going to do? You're going to go... To another part of the country just to go to a beach. No shade. But it's facts. It's facts. It's facts. So a lot's been said about weddings. And, you know, I wrote this piece that came out of Philly Mag. Um, and 
I was like, what you mean? And I said to them about the piece, the stuff I was writing about, you know, making those tough decisions. <laughs> and the tough decisions is being that, you know, from last episode I talked about this is, you know, axing people off of the wedding um, for not being fully vaxxed. And I wrote more about it for this piece I did for Philadelphia Magazine, where I really dived into what got me to that point. Well, really, both of us, because Mr. Johnson and I had to make that decision together. It was not something that I just was like, oh, I just, you know, it was we both had conversation about this and our vendors and everyone involved. And as these numbers and these cases increase and, and now there's, you know, booster shots and things, it was a serious uh, situation. It was a serious conversation, and and the piece went viral. A lot of people have shared it. People have been messaging me about it. A lot of people read it. Thousands of you all, um, which I'm so grateful for and happy that I know there's so many weddings happening in the fall, and I'm happy that this could help other couples um, figure out how to navigate that type of situation because. For us, the, us COVID wedding, you know, wedding people, you know, COVID couples, I guess that's the way to describe it. We're doing something that no one else has done before us. And no one's probably, well, hopefully no one has to do after us. Is that we've had to make decisions about our wedding that has, you know, created unexpected rifts and, you know, friction that would have never been the case. You know, a year, no, two years ago. So it's been interesting. But I also believe, and, and this is, I, I, I know this to be true, that in situations where you have family and friends and people you have relationships with, if people love you and they, and they care for you and they show up, they're going to do what they have to do um, where it's at. You know what I'm saying? Like, they will. They will have to. They. They will. They will make it happen. You know. They'll. They'll show up. They'll get back. They'll do what they got to do. You know. And I feel like that's what has happened here. Is that in some cases you can see folks being like, "Look, if this is what I got to do to come to the wedding, I'll do it." And some people, I guess it wasn't enough. You know. And. The good news is that that waiting list was lit. And that's why I tell people, have a waiting list for your wedding. Have a waiting list. Have a list where people can, you know, anticipate and and show up and show out. And if you could do that, everything else falls into line. Everything else, um, you know, come into place. And, and that's what I believe. And that's what happened. That's what I saw happen with, with this wedding is that people got excited and they really showed up and showed out. And I was like, yeah, this is the kind of, you know, love and support that, you know, I, I want to have. I want to feel. I feel like with weddings, weddings are already a lot to just plan and all that kind of shit. And when it comes to the people who are coming, they shouldn't be a burden. They should be a blessing. They shouldn't be it. You know, they should have enthusiasm. It shouldn't feel like it's exhausting. It should be. It should be enthusiasm. And I'm happy to say that with the new, with the with the wedding that we have now, with the people who are coming, there is like this weight lifted off of the the consistent wondering of, you know, what this person, you know, what is this person going to be good? Is this, you know, like I'm looking at the table arrangements. We're like we look at the table setups and who's sitting with who. And it just, it flows better. And it's also just, again, a, a level of just reassurance. Like, everyone here is 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 safe. And that feels good. That feels good. I, I Nothing compares to that. Um, but, you know, right now there's, there's a lot going on with the pandemic, as you all have been following. Booster shots are coming up. You know, we got vaccinated very early. So we'll be up for booster shots in mid-October which is right around the time of the wedding, but I'm not going to get... I think the... the our, our, so the way it works, the booster shots um, will begin at the end of September. Biden is recommending that people eight months after the second shot should get booster. They're still questioning what to do with the Johnson & Johnson people. 
but this is for all the people who got either the Pfizer or the Moderna. You, if you eight months after you got your second vaccination, you should be, you know, beginning to get the booster shots. The thing about um, that is that we were early birds. So we got our second shot in February. So eight months after this February will be October. So it'll be around October. I'm not going to get the booster shot right before. Like, like I think it lands right on the day of the wedding or before. I, you know, you know, with these shots, you know, you could potentially get tired or feel fatigued or think I'm going to wait after the honeymoon to get it. So after, you know, the honeymoon, everything, then I'll get my second shot. But I'm not going to get it like dead snap the day of the wedding. I'm going to wait until after the wedding which and, and all of that and then get it. Um, so that I can be able to like, you know, enjoy the wedding without wondering like, oh, will I be a little bit fatigued and things like that. Because after that second shot, normally some people get a little tired or fatigued or whatever for the day or for a day or whatever. I just don't want to have any type of potential, you know, tiredness or anything like that on the day of the wedding or right before it. So I'm going to do it right after um, the wedding shower. I mean, the um, honeymoon and then I'll be good. So that's our plan. We both got back on the same day. Um, so that's the, that's the cool part. A couple of my friends, actually, a couple of my friends, we all kind of got back like literally the same day. Like we came in like, look, we're all going to do it together. So we're all like in the same boat, which is kind of dope. Um, and they're doing the same thing too. They're like, okay, we'll get vaxxed after the, like right after the wedding. Cause like nobody wants to be tired or worn out or anything like that. So I that was smart. If you, um, don't know when look at your vax card, it's at eight months after the second shot and your vax card has it dated. So just, it's eight months. And so I love having this podcast because sometimes some of you all probably even know anything about that or didn't know the specifics and details. But apparently it starts at the end of September where well, people can start going out and getting that third uh, booster shot. And so, yeah. I, and, I, and I think what a good time to get the booster shot because this is also around the time of flu season, as you all know. Um, flu season, like I'm about to get my flu shot actually next month uh, in September. Uh, normally I get it in September. No, it's either late August or early September was when I get the flu shot. Normally, like sometimes like after Labor Day. So I'm still getting my flu shot because listen, now that people are back on these streets, the flu is still real too. Like I mean, flu is deadly, but I have been doing good. I have not been sick in years, y'all. Like I have to, like I have to say, I have not been sick in years. You know, I get a headache like anybody else every now and then. But, like, being sick and coughing and, and being bed I have to say, I have, I've been fortunate and blessed enough not to be constrained to the bed. High temperature, fevers, sore throats, and stuff like that. Like, you know, you know every day you may get a little cough or something um, every blue moon. But, like, being, like, bed, you know, stuck to the bed, not being able to do anything, I have not had that in a while. And I think a lot of it has to do with just one, you know, what I think the pandemic has, has helped because, you know, I've been more in tune with like general just hygiene, like washing hands, making sure I'm washing hands. I will say these masks has been a lifesaver. I, lo I love wearing a mask because I think wearing a mask in general has kept a lot of us cleaner and safer um, if, when you're doing it correctly. Like, because let's be clear, the mask is not just protecting against COVID. It's protecting against flu and other shit. You know what I mean? Like, washing these hands, it's not just protecting against COVID. It's protecting against anything else, you know, that could be in your direction. Because, you know, sometimes a person could be coughing around you, and it may not even be COVID. It could just be something else. And it could be, it could be whatever it could be. And wearing a mask is like being like, okay, these germs ain't coming over here, getting me potentially sick. So I just think that has been helpful. And I think last year they were saying that the flu uh, cases of people getting, you know, influenza, whatever, was significantly down. Well, yeah, because that's all we need to do during flu season. Get a flu shot. Uh, wash your hands. Uh, take lodgesins. You know, drink water. Stay hydrated. You know, all of that. And so now to be able to incorporate a mask is, is something because when I went to Penn, you know, there was international students who during flu season used to wear those masks. They used to wear them. And people used to think they were weird and understand why. And 
I never did it, you know, um, because I just, that was the culture. Like, culturally in America, we were not wearing masks. But I remember international students um, when I was at Penn in college that just would, would wear those masks, and they were very, they took flu season seriously. Like, I, you know, I always kept me some hand sanitizer, but I never was like that. Now, because of this pandemic, I, I think about the power of the mask just in general. And, and, and what it's doing just for my entire health overall. And people don't even think about that. Like, we're so fixated on COVID, which we should. But let's think about the benefits, the other additional benefits outside of just COVID alone. Around wearing masks and hygiene. I feel like my overall public health safety hygiene has been at an all-time high in a good way. Like, I'm not just shaking people's hands left and right. And I knew people growing up that was, like, never crazy about shaking hands and things and, and very much like that. But I never really had as much thought about it until recently. And I think that's good. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's just a good idea. I think that we should be, this is, you know, the, the lessons we will learn when this is over, because it will eventually be over, y'all. We'll, there will be a real, real light in the tunnel, even if some dumbasses don't want to get with the program. But... There is a light at the end of the tunnel with this, and I'm super excited about that. So, there's been this viral video um, on Instagram. There was a guy who is does not really wear a mask. He's not vaccinated, and he was on on this video talking about how he's gotten COVID three times, and he's some popular influence on social media, and he's been talking about getting COVID three. How he's gotten COVID three times. And mad about it and talking about how people are dirty and nasty and, you know, trying to make a joke. I mean, he's angry, but he's also making a reference in it, like, that's somewhat supposed to be intended to be for humor, I suppose. And I'm sitting here like, but you got COVID three times. And you're living. And you still and you still won't get vaxxed. How many times do you have to get COVID? Before you take this seriously. Like how many times? I was just baffled by that. Like I was. I was baffled by the number of times. And just the kind of conversation. Like people were still out here. I mean. I'm not shocked anymore. I'm just disappointed. I, I'm just really. I, I, I'm just gagging. Gagging. And I've, I've had some, 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 some hangouts and, I, you know, I'm not trying to be that person to tell people in the words of, if she dies, she dies, you know, N- not, not doing that, not going to be the Rocky dude. But these are the moments where I'm like, hmm, you know, that kind of thing. You know, it's one of those hmm moments, those aha moments. And it's those kind of moments that just make you go, hmm. And people say they don't want to be judged during the pandemic. They say, oh, I don't want to be judged, don't judge. But it's not about judgment. It's really about, how, how do I put this? It's, it's not about judgment. It's the fact that there are people whose lives are being at risk. And the fact that we have so many people who consistently don't take this seriously. Listen, people have the right to in their own personal lives judge you based on how you're deciding to show up in these situations if that makes sense like I want people to understand that these types of decisions are real and there's people out here who if you don't want to take this seriously understand what that means you know, understand understand what that means. Period. 
So that's that's all I gotta say on that <laughs> on that point. So R. Kelly, I R. Kelly's on trial, as you all know. Finally, it's been taking forever in a day to get this man to finally get to this point. And, and of course, as you know, the opening statements from the prosecutor describes this as something that's been a decades long um, mess. And it's been crazy. And it's been a shit show. Um, you know, and it's been, it's been a lot. And one of the things that's been frustrating that, um, you know, that's been frustrating is to see, just to hear new details that we didn't know. Um, that's been frustrating. And that's been the biggest pain, you know. Uh, like, so one interesting detail that's kind of come from the trial so far uh, is that, you know, we all know Leah, who was the famous R&B singer icon. This year actually marks the 20th anniversary of her. This actual month actually marks the 20th anniversary of her death. She died tragically in a plane, a plane crash after filming that music video that we all know and love called Rock the Boat um, off of her Red Album, as we call it, the Red Album, which is a self-titled album, which is probably one of the most impeccable contemporary R&B albums of all time. And for those who don't know, that album doesn't come out in streaming until September next month um, because there has been a long going dispute with her family um, over releasing her music um, on streaming platforms. So for over 20 years, well, I mean, for 20 years, basically, you I mean, you could buy these albums physically, but most people don't buy physical albums. Um, accessing these songs like for download purposes and things like that on the internet was just not it was impossible unless you had to um, stream the music um, through YouTube so someone like myself like I am a Leah fan I love Aaliyah uh, love her music and I grew up listening to her and I remember as somebody I was 10 years old Nine years old? I was like nine. Because this happened... Oh my God, this happened in 2000... And, well, there was a lot go. This is right before 2011. 9-11. And I was... Shit, I was nine years old when she passed. But it almost feels like... I mean, I don't know. I, it, I That was the music I grew up to. I mean, Nutty, Nutty Professor. I remember, you know... Are You That Someone? You know... Uh, one in a million, of course. I mean, all of that music. I mean, that was my childhood music. And when she, and I remember when I was young, because when I was around 10 years old and whatnot, 106 in Park with Free and AJ. Now AJ is a whole creep. But remember Free and AJ used to be on there. It was on BET. It was like our TRL because TRL was what the white folks watched on MTV, which, you know, I watched it sometimes, but like they didn't like have, you had to be a super, super famous black person, like Beyonce, Destiny's Child, Nelly, you know, like mainstream crossover black artists got on TRL. But 106 and Park, when they did their countdown, these were like videos and artists that like black artists knew that was being played in those music videos. So you had like Mystical, Juvenile, and Cash Money was big. I mean, Back That Ass Up was a big song. But like, I'm thinking about like, just like some of the like, like Bone Crusher, uh, <laughs> like all of those like underground rappers, diplomats, like, you know, 50 Cent, you know, and, and, and 50 Cent cr had crossover appeal too, but like all the other videos and songs and hit artists like Tweet and, and, and a lot of Missy Elliott videos and people like that, just like be, like Bow Wow used to always chart, like always be number one when little when he was little Bow Wow, of course, and Destiny's Child videos and, and, and things like that, like, well, since the park was like the place for that. And when Aaliyah passed, I remember like all of every week, every day, like Aaliyah rock the vote video, more than woman video was like number one on 106 and park for like ever. 
I used to remember calling and like um, going on on the website when it was like AOL and like trying to vote multiple times. Yes, those were the days. <laughs> okay, go judge your uncle. Those were the days, okay? That's when we had real fandom, okay? When you would sit there and you would try to get on your computer and, and run up your mind, you know, run up the, the, the modem or whatever the shit was and, and, and you would call the radio station, you would demand that song to be played to have the number one song of the day or the night or whatever for an artist. That was real. Like, this shit that the kids do on social media now, Twitter, and Instagram, like, this is... Real fans... Okay, we bought the CDs. We would buy multiple CDs. I remember the days when Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, these people would sell a million physical, physical copies in a week. Okay, when their albums dropped, you was in line. Okay, you was in, there were long lines. Okay, nobody, people waited. Okay, I remember watching TRL in Houston and seeing Times Square in New York be packed. Okay, people had real fans. Okay, people bought albums. People bought C like this whole uh, this crap they do down in the music industry with the whole equivalent like equivalent streams equal albums. I mean, I guess, but like no one makes albums like anymore for real, for real. I mean, a couple artists do, but like it's, I remember when you know people really bought it. Now I may sound like an old head now. Shit, twenty nine might feel like the new forty. To people, but shit, it was the that was the those were the days, and real fans know. Okay, you didn't just buy an album; you bought T-shirts, you bought posters, you you know you bought the meals at McDonald's. You 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 had to get the posters. You had to get uh, shit, anything. I remember, I remember they used to brand people on everything. Like Britney Spears was on Coca Cola cans. She was on cereal boxes. She was a Barbie doll. Like I remember when Brandy was a Barbie doll. Like I just this is nostalgia overload. But real people know what I'm, the young listen. Millennials know what I'm talking about. Okay, the 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 we the, we had capitalism in the early 2000s. Those economic booms, Y2K buzz when people were selling shit. People could get away with selling anything. Okay, if you had a name, like celebrity culture was a whole different beast. I mean, celebrity culture is weird now, but that shit was at a halt. Was listen, it was something like fame was so different. And so when people want to talk about Britney Spears, quote unquote, losing it, because Britney Spears was living the kind of life and the fame and everything that we like these, these artists. Don't have that. Like, whenever you talk about some, I'm famous, I have a bunch of followers on Instagram, who gives a fuck? Like, this was the, listen, it, you ain't Britney Spears famous, though. Like, Britney Spears famous was, your teacher at school knew who Britney Spears was. Everybody knew who Britney Spears was. ABC, Barbara Walters was doing interviews with Britney Spears, and it was getting millions of views on TV. Your parents knew the songs. Everybody knew the songs. Nowadays, these rappers and artists that be out, people don't know who these rappers are half the time. They might be quote-unquote hits with the kids, but your teacher probably never heard of Little Baby or, or, or half of these rappers. But when I was growing up, music artists were so famous that everybody knew the songs. They knew them so much that they hated them. They was like, you cannot play this in school. Stop playing that Nelly song. Like, it was just that kind of thing. Like, <sighs> culture, culture. Like you talk about Eclipse. Remember Eclipse, where the kids used to the number one beat was grinding, and they used to bang that all day on the cafeteria table. That is a different type of famous. No one, the kids nowadays don't understand that. Like it's like okay, they follow them now. People buy their followers on Instagram and Twitter. People buy clout. You couldn't buy clout back then like that. I mean, if you were hot. You were hot. If you were not, you were not. Okay? It, it was just a different era. I just I just remember that in my childhood. But I say all that to say that, because I digress. <laughs> Aaliyah's death was huge. It was like Kurt Cobain passing for, like, the R&B community. Like, when we lost her, it's like 20 years later, people are still sad. Like, Aaliyah died, I think, at, like, 22 years old. This, this is about to pass 
her, 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 the number of years she's died, she's been dead, is going to be the number of years she's alive very soon. And yet, regardless of that, it's still, it's a tough thing for fans. And people who knew her and loved her um, and just loved her music. And it's crazy because now some of her music is back on streaming. So one in a million, that album, you can listen to it now. It's on, um, it's now streaming now. So I've heard it today. And I'm like, this music sounds like it could come out today. It's that, her, her music is, was so ahead of its time. Like when Red, when the Red album comes out, when Aaliyah's self-titled album comes out next month, I promise you, I will be listening to that thing almost every day, probably up until my wedding. Like I will probably be listening to that all year long because I've been waiting to hear it pure. I've been listening to bad YouTube videos and bad streaming. I have not been able to listen to that song, that, that album in its totality through my streaming ears. I have been burning to listen to that album like the right way and i know there's controversy in the family with, with everybody but you know it's gonna be that thing where i'm like look i know this is probably not how the family wanted it all to work out with the music but i'm gonna have to live with that understanding that aspect of it but god damn it i wanted to hear this album for so long and it's been 20 years and i've been missing this and it's such a timeless record and yeah, I gotta listen to this album. Um, but I listened to One in a Million today, and it just came out today, and it's phenomenal. And it's it just reminds me of just like how time. I'm just I just can't keep taking the word timeless out. But <sighs> I digress because I'm guess I'm pushing from the fact of what I need to really say about what happened with this situation. So Aaliyah and R. Kelly had a relationship. Uh, it was statutory rape, to be very clear. Um, she was underage when she was dating him. This was in the 90s. Um, they got married. And a lot of... there was they, they tried to hide it, but you know there was a marriage license involved. A lot of people were trying to figure out what caused the relationship. But we find out that allegedly Aaliyah was... Well, Aaliyah was pregnant. And apparently... R. Kelly, I don't, she, she doesn't have the baby, but R. Kelly marries her so that he essentially did not want her to be impl implicate him. So they get married as a way to cover up the sexual behavior, the sexual actions and, and whatnot. He marries her to implicate her from basically saying something. Now, I don't think that that was understood between at the time between him, but R. Kelly's interest in marrying her wasn't necessarily, according to the prosecutors, rooted in love. Like this, I love you. It was more so of a, I'm a fucking pedophile, I'm a creep, and I'm trying to cover my tracks, and this is the way I can cover my tracks. So that's what we find out, a revelation that we find out during the trial. Disgusting. Just disgusting. And it's infuriating. It's infuriating as a fan to have to hear this, because fuck. Fuck. You know, it was it was it was just really that was a hard pill to swallow. You know, um, that was a hard pill to swallow. Here's my like that, um, especially with everything going on, just whew, just a lot. So I just can't wait till this trial is over. You know, abolitionists talk aside, lock that motherfucker the fuck up. Like, period. Like, it's over. I, I just don't, like, there's just, I have no, like, R, R. Kelly is somebody that I just have, like, no, no empathy for whatsoever. R. Kelly has done things to so many women. I mean, I'm not even going to tell you to watch Surviving R. Kelly. You don't have to watch Surviving R. Kelly. Just believe women, period. So, speaking of sexual assault, abuse, rape, and other things of that nature. Um, Kenneth Petty, who is, I guess, married to Nicki Minaj. He's her husband. He's the father of her child. Um, his sexual assault victim 
basically wants everybody to know, including Nicki Minaj, that he that this man raped her. He was convicted. He was arrested. Back in 95, they had a this woman, her name is Jennifer um, Hugh, I believe it is. I, I may be pronouncing it wrong. H-O-U-G-H. Jennifer Hugh, I guess. Um, is, is currently suing Nicki Minaj and her husband, Kenneth Petty, for harassment and witness intimidation. I mean, she's been claiming that associates of their the couple, which I guess they go by the Petties, um, tried to bribe and bully her into silence. I mean, we're talking lots of money. Um, so let's back this up. In 95, Kenneth Petty was convicted of first degree attempted First degree attempted rape after he sexually assaulted her with, at knife point. Uh, this woman Jennifer, um, she told the Daily Beast back in the spring, and she's been talking to the press about this. Um, that associates of the couple began pressuring her um, to recant her story uh, after you know he was re- arrested. Um, and I'm talking about Kenneth Petty, Nikki's husband, was arrested. Um, after failing to register as a sex offender. And that was a mandate because he did, he did a plea deal. He was supposed to register as a sex offender and he isn't doing that. And so, you know, again, the last week, a friend, you know, sent her a video um, that someone posted on Facebook stories um, that was attempting to threaten her life. This is ridiculous. And people are trying to figure out what Nicki Minaj has to do with this. Well, allegedly, according to this woman, um, Nicki has been really a part of this process. I mean, to the point where, uh, you know, she said there was references and people, you know, trying to bribe her for $20,000. In her lawsuit, uh, Jennifer Hughes' lawsuit, she says that... um, Apparently, this man, some man who was involved in this process, put uh, her on the phone with Nicki Minaj in March and eventually offered her $20,000 in cash on the couple's behalf. $20,000. Yeah. So it's been a lot going on. There's been so much stuff. I mean... Apparently, she tried to avoid speaking publicly about her assault for years. Um, she did a YouTube interview in 2018 to clarify that she and Petty were not in an interview, were not in a relationship because, you know, Nikki has been publicly trying to uh, mischaracterize, according to her, all of the stuff that was going on in a relationship. So there was never a relationship between this man, Kenneth Petty, and Nikki. I mean, Nikki's, uh, well, sorry, there was never a relationship between Kenneth Petty and and this woman jennifer jennifer claims they they never dated it was not a we dated and i'm lying on him for rape it was none of that kind of stuff but basically nikki has been trying to say that on you know queen radio and other types of um media outlets and, and things of that nature it's complicated it's messy and you know she's consistently have you know said this woman wrongly accused him but tried to say that she wrote, you know, Nikki said on the radio that she had written a letter recanting her statement, but never failed, filed it for fear of being jailed. And this woman claims she never wrote such a letter. I mean, consistently have been lying. Um, she says that she's been attacked on social media by the quote unquote, the barbs, um, which is Nikki's fan base. And there has been so much has happened. And at this point, um, she's fighting, you know, she's suing. She's suing them, um, and it's it's going public. I, I've had moments where I've been a Nikki fan. I appreciate Nikki's talent, but at this point, I, I just can't get with her right now. I can't be a fan. I mean, there's been so many things I've heard about this case, but the fact is, is that it's obvious that Nikki wants to ride in the sinking ship. Her husband, according to criminal records filed in this victim, he was a sex offender. He's, he, he, he abused this woman. 
He was violent. He committed an act of sexual violence. You did it. And the fact that you're spending, the fact that Nikki is spending resources to try to silence this woman because you don't want the public to know that this man had done this. The fact that you're trying to intimidate this woman, the fact that others are threatening this woman's life. This is violent. This is reckless. It's it's not becoming. And it's hard to, anytime she has a moment where you're like, oh, I want to root for her. It's hard to, you know, to, to support her or to do all that when we know this. Like, why did you marry this man? Why did you have a baby with this man? There's so many other men out here, Nikki. I mean, you've, you know, I mean, Safari is not desirable anymore. Meek Mill, yeah, we're and not. But like, there's so many other options. And the fact that you've chosen this guy and like, who is he? And, 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 and it's like, he's bringing her down. And it's just so disappointing. It's, it's, it's a disaster. And it, we all know this is not going to end well. And the fact that she's not implicating herself in it's like, why do that? Just doesn't make any sense. And other things that don't make any sense. This Jeopardy situation. Like, I don't even, like, what the fuck? Like, first of all, shout out to LeVar Burden. You know, there is so much that needs to be said about this. The updates about what's been going on. You know, Mike Richards, as you all know, is executive producer who was supposed to be um, on the show. And there's kind of, and, and of course, he is executive producer. He used to be at The Price is Right. Um, he was supposed to be the host, the co host of the show, um, even though he was executive producer, which is like weird. Boring white guy. They did a whole series, you know, for the past several weeks, months since. This is Alex Trebek's death to look for the next new host. Everybody really wanted LeVar Burden. There was lots of talk about LeVar Burden. I was crazy about LeVar Burden doing it. And at the end of the day, you know, Mike Richards, you know, is is going to end up being the guy at the end. So it's like this mediocre white man ends up taking over this show. And it's like, well, what the fuck? Why, why did that even happen? Well, there was concerns about his issue with The Price is Right. But then another bombshell story comes out, which was in The Ringer, talking about some of his other past situations. Like he was on a podcast mocking women and Jewish people and other marginalized communities. And then, you know, rather than address that, he just scrubs the podcast off of the internet um, and takes all that out. And so it's like, it's it's one of those things where he doesn't want to be accountable. He consistently fucks up. And so now he's stepping down as the host He's going to still be the executive producer. But it's like, no, you don't get it. You don't be the executive producer and you don't be the host. You, don't, you need to get the fuck away from Jeopardy. Like, step all the way from it. But, like, the interesting thing is, is that LeVar Burden was standing there the whole time. Now, there's been some re- reports that, you know, the week that LeVar Burden was on, the, the ratings weren't as high or there wasn't much boom. But see, that was set up by design because details that people don't talk about was that he was literally doing Jeopardy the week of the first week of the Olympics. Also, Jeopardy's show that week, they, they kept moving the, the, the time of the show because of the Olympics. So there wasn't any consistent viewership because one, the fucking Olympics, the fucking Olympics. And oh, that's right. The fucking Olympics. The first week of the Olympics, like literally aired. And so no one was watching Jeopardy or as much as they should. Now, I was doing some DVRing because I did want to support LeVar and I did listen to uh, and watch, you know, the episodes. I wasn't glued to Olympics like that either, but like it was a lot going on that week and it wasn't a fair run. Like he should have had a clear week where there was no major, like, I don't know, the fucking Olympics being on. And there should be consistent scheduling so he would have had the same shot as those other white co-hosts or special guest hosts. He didn't get that. They played him out so late. So they set him up for failure. They set him up for failure on design. By design. And then turned around and just like that gave it to this boring ass guy, Mike Richards. So it was like they didn't want him to get it. And Mike Richards did that on purpose. He's a hater. I don't trust this man. Clearly this man already is a problem. And it's obvious that all the anticipation, the hype. I mean, LeVar Burton was getting 
feature stories, profiles written about the possibility of him doing this show. I know that made this mediocre white man jealous. And so he sabotaged LeVar Burden's appearance on that show. Clearly. And that's what happened. That's really what happened. And now he's stepping down. So what? Black guy is supposed to sit up here and, 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 and save him and save the day? I hate that. This, like, LeVar should have got it the first time. Like, I, I don't know if he's going to end up making a decision to take the show. But it's just like now the legacy. Like, Alex Trebek is rolling in his grave right now, probably. That a show that he's helped build... For decades, over 8,000 episodes, and you're just going to sit up here, and you're going to ruin an iconic American show. This show has been on for nearly, I mean, this show has been on for 38 years, 38 seasons, since 1984. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. And, and it's just another example of how racism... You know, in bias, right, ruins a good thing. This is a good thing. This was a good thing, and now it's got to be caught up in this in this bullshit. So I'm I'm not happy about this, to be quite honest. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. So speaking of fans, OnlyFans. <laughs> So OnlyFans, as you all know, because I, I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts. And you all have asked me about my thoughts about OnlyFans. And I've been talking about OnlyFans for a minute. And it's so much to be said about this OnlyFans thing, y'all. I just, y'all, it's been, it's been a lot. So let's get to OnlyFans. OnlyFans, as you all know, was that digital platform since the pandemic. Okay, since last year where a lot of people, well, yes, a lot of people, who were sex workers, it was the destination because they was able to, you know, perform adult content and make money in a very safe virtual way, you know, because OnlyFans allow for subscriptions and all that. I mean, I've never uh, subscribed to OnlyFans. I don't have an OnlyFans subscription. I've just heard the stories from fans and people who I know who have talked about it. And of course, follow some of the drama with celebrities. So when OnlyFans happened during the pandemic, it was a way for people, you know, sex workers to make money. And let me just be able to say that I am pro sex work. I think people who perform a service should get paid in a safe, humane, and dignified manner. Emphasis on safe, humane, and dignified manner. Okay, if it's human trafficking and other things of that nature, okay, that's not the type of sex work. And that's not even sex work, that's human trafficking. There should be no conflation. But I'm not for any of that kind of shit, right? This is legal. This is healthy. Um, people doing it in ways that is that is ethical and, and all that. So I feel like if you're an adult and you want to go on OnlyFans and you want to um, do some things, something strange for a little bit of change, knock your socks off. It's, it's, if it's consensual, it's, a, it's your business. Do your thing, okay? That's how I feel about it. So, you know... This was a site. This was an opportunity for people to have that outlet and for sex workers to do so in an environment where, you know, trying to perform or do certain acts during a pandemic, okay, that could potentially get you COVID or something like that. Clearly, that's not desirable. Only fans was an outlet for those people to do different type of work. So there was benefit there. Well, only fans has decided this week that they want to shut down the dope content. So now sex workers don't have only a friend and only fans, even though that's what made the site famous. That's what's made the platform famous because of the fact that this was an outlet for amateur or uh, professional sex workers to be able to do their thing. Now only fans is shutting it all down, uh, shutting that aspect of it down. I, I guess they're keeping content for other, I guess, only fans is doing other things than just adult entertainment. I mean, I didn't know that, that such a thing existed. But I guess because celebrities are doing OnlyFans, I guess, like, that is not adult content. So people like to go on OnlyFans to subscribe to exclusive fun content that their favorite artists and musicians are doing. I guess other people are using OnlyFans for other ways outside of adult entertainment. I don't know. I've never, again, I've never had an OnlyFans account. So... It's been a lot of backlash. A lot of people in the community are upset about it. People have been speaking out about it. People have been going off. 
I'm, I, I have to agree that this is not new. We saw this with Tumblr, where Tumblr, you know, for, for a while was building a major identity based off of people posting adult content. And then all of a sudden, they were like, yeah, nah, we're not doing that. And then they took it off. And then uh, Tumblr tanked viewers, uh, engagement tanked on Tumblr. Um, and so it just collapsed. Like, I mean, well, come, Tumblr didn't collapse. It's still around. But just the vibe and the energy of Tumblr has just, like, changed. And so oh, people are projecting that OnlyFans might experience the same thing. But here's the thing with OnlyFans that I knew the end was coming. Several things. One is that, in some sense, this is nothing new, right? A lot of these websites will sit up and exploit um, sex work, queer content, you know, anything that they can say is taboo, right? And they will exploit it. They will let it fly on their sites and people will go crazy and they will build hype off of it. And then when the hype is there, for whatever reasons, they pull out the meat, they pull out the heart or the artery and think that they could, you know, because they, they make money off of it. So like OnlyFans built its stock and its value and its desirability off of this type of sex, uh, sex workers being on there, uh, a lot of that kind of energy. And then they decided once they made enough money, right, and it was, it was, it was fly, then they can say, okay, fuck you all. We're not doing this anymore, okay? So it was exploitation because it was only, they only gassed up the site for their own profitability, only for them to now change it. But look who got impacted by it. The very marginalized people, the very uh, destitute folks that needed that site um, to survive and, to, and to, to do their thing. So it's, it's just reckless. And these platforms consistently do things like this that exploit everyday people um, often. And that's, that's really frustrating and sad. But the, the other issue um, within that, right, is that a lot of the, you know, these other content sites and these platforms that try to uh, facilitate this and host this, you know, they, they don't really, you know, I think of like Clubhouse where, you know, like who the fuck is on Clubhouse now except for crazies, hoteps, board folk, uh, folks that are still trying to sell, scam, or, or be entertained by such. It's not this, like Clubhouse is pretty much dead to me. And I knew Clubhouse would be obsolete because, I mean, there's Twitter uh, who's got their squares and their, their, their new thing where you can log in and be on squares and do those chats. I mean, that was such a, a short lived phenomenon. We all started off thinking Clubhouse was going to be the hottest thing. And then Clubhouse came and went. Because it just got too big for its britches. And then it built the infrastructure to match the heat. And it wasn't sustainable because it turned into a very toxic place. And then people quickly got over the whole thing. It was a moment. It was a sensation. It was hot. And then it was not. Like, I don't even know if Clubhouse is on Android now. I don't even know what happened to Clubhouse. Like, I remember, like, when I was on Clubhouse, for the small stint of time I was on Clubhouse, I remember it was like, it was like, it was iconic. It was epic moments. I had some epic um, clubhouse moments, but it was like short lived. Like, it was like I got on, I want to say late December, like maybe mid December um, in January. And then I eventually got off and stopped dealing with the app probably by February, like end of February. Like, I was over it by then. Like, by the time spring was coming, I was like donezo with it. Like, I don't even. Like, I don't know the last time I logged in. I don't know who's still on Clubhouse. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like, it was a moment. It was an addiction. Like, I remember getting sucked up into Clubhouse. Like, you could be on there for hours on end and just be in it. But, like, they really gassed up the hype because black people, you know, made it hot. And then, all of a sudden, it just collapsed. But I'm going to tell you what happened with Clubhouse that is also what happened with OnlyFans and why I think the OnlyFans phenomenon is also feeling the same way. And that is, ding, 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 celebrities. Celebrities ruin fucking everything. Like, celebrities ruin these types of experiences. I mean, celebrities almost ruin Twitter until Twitter users are like, oh, you know what? The joke's on y'all because we're going we gonna to clap back at y'all too, right? People like me snapping at Justin Timberlake and clapping back at him humbles the space because 
everyday people can push back at these celebrities like, okay, you know what, you're doing too much, and yeah, right? And then people argue it's council culture, but we'll save that for the book. I, I don't think that it, it, I think, <laughs> I think celebrities, they just don't know how to just be, just be, right? I'm not even going to say be normal or regular because that's just not their life. But they just don't know how to fucking be. And so what happens, and what exactly happened with Clubhouse is, the celebrities will come in the rooms, right? Those rooms. And they would just, some of them, I think, just want to be in the mix. But there's also this point for them where it's like, oh, I can't just be in the mix. I, I have to be nosy. Like, I need to be seen. Like, they want attention. And it's like, okay, but I just want to talk about the ills of the world. But you want me to now, like, now you come in and now everyone in the room is like, oh, my God, Lupe Fiasco's in your room. And now we have to let Lupe on the thing. Or Lakeith Stanfield is in the moaning room. We got to bring him up. And then it becomes a whole different element and we lose sight of what's important. And that's what how what ruined Clubhouse was that it was just too many celebrities. Like, whenever Meek Mill and DJ Academic and all these other nuts got on Clubhouse rooms and chats, it just became an entirely different experience. And it just became posturing and groupies and fandom. And it just never became a normal experience. And the best moments I had in Clubhouse were moments where it was just everyday people or, or folks that were, you know, having tough conversations. And there was, you know, accountability sessions. And so I just missed, you know, it was a moment. But it, it got ruined because celebrities ruined it. And I think about... Only fans and only fans got ruined by celebrities because I remember when Safari, you know, Nikki's ex, um, who I guess is largely endowed in certain positions, decided that he wanted to start, you know, providing adult content on the site. And then there was other celebrities who was doing similar things. They were making thousands upon thousands of dollars of putting up nasty adult content, um, you know, for subscribers. And so People like Safari was making thousands of dollars because he was swinging his, you know, diggling all on camera. And it got annoying because to a certain extent, I think what happened with, 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 with OnlyFans, if I'm not mistaken, was that there was a celebrity who got tons of people to give her money, um, but she didn't provide the content that matched what she was selling. I think her name was Bella Thorne, I think I read about. And as a result, OnlyFans changed their whole financing model of payment for talent because of that shit show. Because there were people who wanted refunds and they were upset and, and you know and all of that. And it kind of fucked up the, the money system flow. So they had to change it, which made it harder for sex workers to get access to the funds immediately um, that they were being paid because this stupid ass celebrity who really just should have never been playing on this fucking app, um, you know, decided to do that. And then that, you know, made it harder for everyday people who, you know, do sex work. So it was just, you know, it's just celebrities want ev everything in the sense that they so badly want to, you know, capitalize off of whatever the social, cultural zeitgeist of the moment, but then they, they, they do more harm. And then people that they claim they care about or try to act like they care about get harmed by whatever reckless decision they make. And it's just, yeah, it's just annoying. And so what's happened now on OnlyFans, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm in solidarity with the sex workers. I hope that they, you know, that there is another platform or outlet that allows them the resources for them to, you know, thrive and survive because goddamn, like, what the, you know, what the fuck? So, yeah. Fuck OnlyFans. For real. So, lastly, I get, well, well, semi-lastly, um, The White Lotus, this show, okay, I watched it. I, I've had some mixed thoughts. So, it's created by a guy named Mike White, and he's very white. Um, he is the executive producer, director, the writer, the creator. And this show, The White Lotus, is, it's hot. 
I don't want to get too much into it. Maybe some of y'all may want to watch it. I do encourage you to watch it. I think you should watch it and, and see it for yourself. It's six episodes. It's a miniseries. It's an hour each. So it's, a, it's, it's very bingey. You know, you can you know, watch it on a rainy Saturday or whatever. Just go through the motions and just set some time aside and just, just binge it for a day and, and, and just relax. And I kind of did that this week. I, I kind of just like, you know, flew right through it and watched it and got my life. Um, at first watch, I was very intrigued. And then as I began to take time to reflect on the show and unpack it, I was like, was it as good as I thought it was? Or was I just so caught up in the awe of it? I don't know. I I, I don't know. It's a very, it's, it, I don't want to tell the show, but it's basically a show about rich white people, pretty much. And there is some people of color that's integrated in the show, like, Natasha Rothwell, she's an incredible actress. She was, of course, in um, she was in she's done a lot of things actually. But I guess um, you know she is in that show with Issa Rae. She's done a couple of other like side projects. Um, well, she was in Insecure with Issa Rae. She was in Insecure. Um, and the show's on is about to get ready for his final season. But she was in Insecure with Issa Rae, and she's been to some other projects, but she's in this miniseries, and she's phenomenal. Um, I mean, the, the show is basically about a bunch of rich white people and how their wealth, privilege, and other aspects of themselves collide with their identity and self-worth and importance, and it's supposed to be a critique about this life and this world. But in a sense, while it is a critique, it reinforces status quo. But I don't want to tell too much about what happens, but it's just moments where I'm like, mm. but there are moments where you go, ah, and it's just, uh, did I like it? I thought I liked it. Okay, I'll just say, I'll say this much. I mean, watch it for yourself. Take your notes. Figure out how you feel about it. I don't want to ruin it, but it's interesting. I'll just say that much. Um, very, like I said, I think it should be it should be watched. It should be debated and discussed amongst people. But one of the things that I, I I feel like is that HBO has this thing I've been noticing where for the last couple of years they love to give us a rich white people do dumb crazy things show so like before this was the undoing which was like totally a white show with some crazy ass just crazy and that was nicole kidman and hugh jackman and listen i enjoyed me a good nicole kidman film hugh jackman was pretty good in this you know hugh jackman's on and off as an actor sometimes he's good sometimes he's just always playing the same person not hugh jackman um not Hugh Jackman. I'm sorry. The wrong, 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 wrong Brit. But you know, it, it's, it's some of these actors that um, that are on these types of shows. You know, it, it's it's a certain type. They're just the most the whitest of white actors, and these they they sometimes they feel like they're doing something. You know, really sophisticated, but it's kind of basic. But we just still like it. If that makes sense. Like, we know it's basic. Hugh Grant. The wrong Hugh. Not Hugh. Yeah, so it was Hugh Jackson, but this is Hugh Grant. So Hugh Grant is Jonathan Frazier. That's his character in Undoing. And then the co Kidman plays his wife, Grace Frazier. And if you haven't seen Undoing, you should watch it. It was a great little miniseries. Uh, another great miniseries by HBO. HBO has some good little miniseries. But it, it was an interesting show. Don't know if they, if I would call it interesting, um, but like when you think about like sharp objects or big little lies, it's like every year they have some white, rich white show, affluent white people, privileged, doing their thing, trying to make it happen. It's a lot of that kind of energy, um, and it's always like a series and stuff. So I just have gotten used to this pattern of like white mediocrity and wealth like being a thing just an observation just something I've noticed 
But I encourage you to watch The White Lotus. I encourage you to watch it. I encourage you to, you know, get your life. There are some moments in the show where you're like, oh, wow, you know? And I had a lot of those, oh, wow, moments. But, you know, be critical thinkers. Apply what you don't know. Implement what you don't see. Come with that kind of energy. So lastly... Um, someone's been asking me about this. Well, people, well, several folks actually talked to me about this. And I, I try not to, I mean, not that I don't like giving relationship advice, but people don't, you know, people sometimes ask me, but you know, it's like, I, I guess it's that ask Ernest situation the show or dear Ernest or whatever. And maybe I'll take some of those. Send me some. Maybe this could be a thing. Um, like, you know, hit me up in email or, you know, IG messenger, if you however you, however you can communicate, just give me with a dear Ernest, and I won't name your name. I will just read the the whatever the statement is, whatever the scenario is, and I'll answer it. If you know, and we'll see what we can do. But somebody sent me this, and and actually I got this from like several people in different variations. But I was like, oh, there must be something I should address or talk about. So there is a there has been several people who are in the phases of engagement um, and they are, are interested in being engaged or have been in a relationship for a long time and they see I've been in one and I've gotten married and I got, I mean, getting married but you know, pretty much close, right? <laughs> I have been in situations where you know, because I'm in this process of getting you know, hitched, people have asked me questions about the process and what it's you know what it's like and really more so about the popping the question like you know getting to that point where you're getting on that knee and what that's like and, and how to get there and all that so some of the people I've been you know conversing with and who've asked me this question and I thought it was worth talking about you know fully on the podcast is you know do you pressure one to propose, uh, how does how does one do this? Like, you know, do you force them? Do you, sh- you know, strangle them? Whatever. I want to be clear about something. I did not, um, you know, scare Mr. Johnson to proposing to me. It wasn't one of those you better do this or I'm leaving you kind of things. I want to be real in saying that I think that in a relationship, one, if you've been in a relationship with somebody for a good amount of time, and good amount of time varies to some people. Some people think six months. Some people think a year. Some people think two years. I'm not going to tell you what that good amount of time is. But because everything is based on experience. But let's just say that that a piece of time where you and this person has gotten to the point where y'all felt inseparable. There's some real deep passion. But there's some real consistency. Some real commitment some real investment, okay? Not just a sexual connection, not just some good hookups, but, you know, people starting to spend the night, staying over, money being spent, conversations about personal health, um, you know, supporting people in ways outside of the traditional, hey, here $5 to take the scepter. You know, I don't know, whatever the case is, but you're getting to a point where y'all are getting real deep. Of course, I would say, have a conversation. Where are we going with this? Maybe even before, you know, it gets too, too deep. But, you know, get a gauge of where someone's at. Is this something that you want long term? Or if y'all got into that point of long term, but y'all got an exclusive, maybe, you know, say, hey, what are your thoughts about the future? It shouldn't feel like a daunting question. It should be a real question. If that person says, look, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know nothing. I don't know whatever. That might be a moment to weigh that a little bit more. If you have intentions to be in a different situation. And I'm talking to the person that is projecting the I want to be engaged I want these things if you are coming in this mindset where you want marriage you want these things don't let a cat have your tongue I'm not saying that 
You need to ask them or declare it. You just need to have a conversation about, initial conversation about vision and things. I would say after maybe the, the first two years that Barry and I were dating, we had conversations about, you know, you see yourself marrying a motherfucker like me? You know, like, we, it was casual. Like, those those, those like first, like, one, one and a half years, we just, it was like, okay, could, could we do this? You know, because at that point we started, we wasn't living fully together, I think, at that point. But it was a situation where, you know, we were staying in each other's crib and, you know, he was living on campus, I was at my place. But we was definitely, you know, clothes was in the dresser, food was in the fridge, you know. <laughs> Mi casa, su casa. It was definitely all out of that. And you get to that point where like, okay, it wasn't even like a, for me, it wasn't like a, okay, well, we are. It was just like, once you get in that flow, you're like, all right, so, you know, what do you see? What what does the future look like to you? Do you see me in that future? Do we see each other in this future? If I see you in my future, I'm just expressing what I see. What do you see? And if, if that's, if y'all have a consensus on that, then it's, you know, you could talk about it. And then I think eventually you get to a point, you know, once you've established that, that, you know, maybe it is the conversation about engagement. What would the engagement look like? Even if it's not immediate. I remember getting to that point where I told myself, listen, you know, if you ever want to propose to me, I kind of threw it out there one time. I was like, I would say yes. And I kind of said that to him. And I told him that like maybe third year, third, third and a half year at that point, like I was in that mindset, like if he was to ask me at any moment, I would have said yes. And then fifth year, he proposed. And our situation was not different because we was in school for like the first like half of that time. We was, he was in school, I had got school a little bit uh, I'm, I'm older than him, so I got out of school a little bit later than him, a little bit earlier than him. But he was still in school, so it wasn't like there was me a jump. Now, if you are someone who's completely out of school, you with somebody, I don't know if I, I mean, I can't judge. I, I don't got opinions, but like, I was just be like, if y'all both are dopes, y'all both got jobs, y'all both doing your thing, I don't, I wouldn't say five years for an engagement unless there was an understanding is up to more ideal. My opinion, that wouldn't be, I don't know if I would wait that long for five years, maybe. But, you know, if I was, you know, fully in the, you know, like, like, let's say like, I got a relationship right now where I'm at in my career, money, everything, no school, nothing, anything, everything was done. I don't know if I would be waiting to be 30, 40 people opposed to at, at this point in my career. I would probably be looking around about two to two to two and a half years. From me, me personally, that would should be some movement at that point. Personally, that's my personal opinion. That's not me telling people to do. That's my taste. I would say too is that it needs to feel like something that's mutual. I think when people feel obligated to propose to somebody, that's always a recipe for disaster. Um, I feel like if you're in a situation where you feel like you have to force somebody or you have to drag somebody's hand, if you have to entice fear, if you have to project insecurity or anxiety or whatever the case is in the situation, I think that's that's not love. That's not that's not how it should be. It should never feel like somebody had to do it or their life depended on it. It should never feel like someone had to be obligated to do it because if they didn't do it, then you know, it would be a total disaster. Like, I just think it shouldn't feel forced. If it feels forced, that just sets the relationship up for disaster. How do I know? Because I've seen this shit happen before. There's been this new phenomenon lately, and I've been hearing about this where, maybe it's been going on for years, but a new phenomenon I've been seeing in, like, certain networks that I've been, you know, in, is that a lot of the guys nowadays are, like, straight up proposing to, to, to women. I'm not seeing it I mean, well, shit, I've seen it in the gay community, too. People, period, are proposing to people, and they're calling it, I'm calling it, I'm calling it this, but this is what it is, pacifier engagements. What's a pacifier engagement? It's an engagement where the person was dating this person, and they were whining like a baby about engagement. And basically, 
the person got the engagement ring, like a pacifier, and put it in their mouth to shut them up just to keep them quiet about talking about it, only for them not to, in the end of the day, fulfill the mission to get married. They would either sabotage their ship, end up just breaking it off and moving on with their life and keeping this person somewhat in bondage or quiet for about a year or two. There's a lot of pacifier engagements that go on. Okay? I've seen it where it's just like, I'm just going to tell this person we're getting married. I'm going to propose to them, give them a ring to make them feel good so they can have a little social media moment. Because some people out here are getting engaged for the gram. Like the, the idea and the magic of an engagement is more important to them than the actual idea of a life spent for life or forever with a person. Like a lot of people are not thinking even about the idea. Like when I got proposed to, in my mind, I was like, I'm going to be with this man for the rest of my life. Like we're going to get married. This is going to happen. Like this is fucking serious. Like my mind and my whole experience, it wasn't just like, I don't know, people be just out here, oh, you know, you know, they proposed to me, I got a ring on my finger. It's like, do you understand how serious this is? Do you understand what that means? Do you understand like what that's how your life changes? Like my life forever changed in that moment. Like I realized, oh, this is this is deep. Like okay. And when I said yes, I thought about it. I thought about it before it even happened. Like, what would I do if this man proposed to me? And I was like, yes. And I was like, Hell yeah. And I knew it because that's what I felt. And I don't think people take, some people don't take the time to really think about it. Not just the person saying the yes, but the person proposing. Like when you get on that damn knee or when you do this, do you understand it's more than just simply professing love or just trying to convince a person where you, it, it has to be a real thing. And if both of you all cannot wait for that or the time in which you want this person to do this is in line with your personal time or whatever you got going on, then maybe it's not meant to be. And you can accept that and move on and get what you deserve somewhere else with someone else. But just this, you know, I don't know. Just don't, it shouldn't be forced. And um, yeah, I, I just think that's something I've learned over the years, seeing situations happen to folks in my social circles and my network. I just feel like real love is organic and it should be as organic as the food that you eat most of the time, right? I mean, we got cheesy love sometimes, but I just think that it should be organic. It should feel real. Um, it, it, you should, it should just be a consensus. It should be a certainty in that decision. And too often people just treat it like it's a superficial thing that they can eventually get to. Like, okay, I know it's not real now, but it can get there. No, it, it starts at the beginning. It starts at the first meeting. It starts with the dates. It starts with meeting family and friends. It's, it's, a, it's a holistic experience. And it's inexplicable. So, yeah. I'm super excited about what's to come. I'm doing countdowns already. I can't wait to update you on some things. I am keeping secrets. I, I'm keeping secrets again. I know that y'all be like, come on. But there is something... There are some things going on right now, and I have to be quiet about it, but stay tuned, and as always, be best. Earnestly Speaking is recorded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. To stay up to date with the latest on the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mr. Ernest Owens. Use the hashtag Earnestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ErnestOwens.com.